First thing I want to do this morning is share uh, some exciting news about our Christmas Eve offering. As you all know, that each year we gather on Christmas Eve and we give 100% uh, of our offering, and this year we're giving it to children and families. We're giving it locally to children through uh, families through Family Promise, and then uh, internationally through a, the, our, an orphanage, Future Light Orphanage in Cambodia, as well as our sister church in India. Um, but you all gave on Christmas Eve $6,689. So I think that's awesome. It's great to see uh, just the generosity of our church members to bless others uh, as a, a way of celebrating Jesus' birth. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, today is uh, you know, the first time, obviously in years, that New Year's Eve falls on a Sunday. And Methodists have a long-standing tradition of holding what is called a covenant renewal service on Christmas Eve. So this morning, we're going to partake in that. And for my message, I simply want to introduce that and explain what that means. And then we're going to enter into a covenant prayer together. So the heart of the service will be a, a joint corporate prayer. Um, and the words of the prayer will be on the screen but we also want to make those words available to you with copies on paper. So, do we have any ushers? I'm asking that because the youth are our ushers today. And I told them, I need you all to usher once the service starts. And I think they all left. Okay, that was a really effective talk. That really worked. Um, so, <laughs> there's, here comes our youth director and our head usher. Okay! So, as I introduce this, oh, they were hanging out in my office. Good to know. Okay. So, guys, there's paper in the back. It's goldenrod. Come and bring it and hand it out. All right. Awesome. So, uh, as I make this introduction, they're going to be handing out uh, the words of this covenant renewal service. So, I want to just share a little bit about why we're doing this. And the main reason is that in Scripture, we discover that God is a God of covenant. Uh, in Genesis, God makes a covenant with Abraham that becomes God's covenant with Israel. And the covenant is a simple one. I will be your God, and you will be my people. That's the covenant. I will be your God, you will be my people. Now, on June 14th, 1997, uh, I made a covenant with Cindy Rowe. I will be your husband, you will be my wife. Uh, not an easy covenant, but a pretty clear straightforward one, and a covenant that in many ways mirrors the covenant that God made with Abraham and Sarah and their descendants. So God makes this covenant with Israel in order to bless all the nations, in order to save the world. So in scripture, we discover that God is a God of covenant, and as God's people, we enter into covenant with God. We say, yes, you are our God, and yes, we are your people. So if we ran out, then um, they'll be on the screen. But the idea was for families to kind of share them together. So um, I think we got a few rows up here that could use some. So if you've got one as a family, then let's just kind of pass them down here if we need any more. I don't know if we need any more. We got some up here. All right. All right. Now, one of the things that's special for me as a, as a pastor is every now and then I'm asked to do a, a renewal of vows, right? A renewal of the covenant. And so we find that in marriage, there are times when it's helpful to renew our marriage vows, to renew our covenant. And the same is true in our covenant with God. And, and we find a great example of that in today's scripture. So I know we just heard three verses out of 2 Kings 23, but here's what's going on in today's scripture. The king is King Josiah. And Josiah becomes king when he's eight years old. Imagine if you have an eight-year-old. <laughs> Josiah becomes king when he's eight-year-old, and he follows a line of just really bad kings. Kings who disobey God. Time and time again, we're told that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. They, they worship other gods, they set up worship sites to other gods, and they really lead the nation of Israel to turn their back on God, to walk away from their covenant with God. But Josiah is different. 
Josiah is committed to God and to God's way. And so Josiah starts to turn Israel back to God. And one of the things Josiah does is he says, you know, let's, let's um, basically renovate the temple. And in their renovation of the temple, the high priest finds the book of the law, which had been lost or forgotten. God's people had, had turned so far away from God that they were completely ignoring God's word. And when Josiah discovers the word of God, and when it is read to him, he is so moved that he tears his clothes. In essence, crying out, we need to repent. We need to turn back to God. We need to renew our covenant with God. And so that's what he does. He gathers everyone together in the temple. He reads the words of the book of the covenant to them. And he makes a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments and decrees with all his heart and soul, and to live out God's word. And all the people join King Josiah in this covenant renewal. Now that covenant renewal service took place in 622 B.C. In 1755... John Wesley led Methodists in their very first covenant renewal service. Early Methodists then established a tradition of having a covenant renewal service on New Year's Eve as a way of saying to God, we want to renew our covenant with you. We want to recommit ourselves to be your people at the start of this new year. And we do so in Jesus Christ through his grace and his faithfulness. So this morning, we're going to renew our covenant with God with words that Methodists have been declaring for 262 years. And in fact, the words that will be on the screen and the words that are on your handout are words that are taken directly from a service that John Wesley led in 1780. As I mentioned before, our opening hymn was written by Charles Wesley specifically for covenant renewal services. Now, at this point, some of you may be thinking, I don't remember making any covenant with God. Okay? And fair enough. Not all of us have necessarily. You know, some here this morning may be checking out Christianity, exploring what the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ is like. And if you're here kind of exploring Christianity, we are so honored that you're doing so. I think most, if not all of us, have been to a wedding. So we know what that covenant ceremony looks like. But what does the ceremony look like when we make our covenant with God? Baptism. Baptism is a covenant ceremony. In fact, if you look in the Methodist hymnal, you'll see it called exactly that, the baptismal covenant, which is God's word to us proclaiming our adoption by grace and our word to God promising our response of faith and love. In baptism, God says, I am your God, and we say, we are your people. Now, in infant baptism, as we were part of this morning, parents enter into this covenant on behalf of their children so that, that children are brought up into the family of God in anticipation of the day when they will say their own yes to God. My wedding was a declaration that I belong to Cindy. Baptism is a declaration that we belong to Jesus. If you have been baptized, you belong to Jesus and have entered into a covenant with God. Now, I want to give you a moment to look over the words of this covenant that we are about to enter into together. And we can put the opening slide up on the screen. Um, so I want just to give you a moment to look at this because, once again, these are words from 1780. And these are words that we're going to declare together. So I want you to look at what you're going to be saying, okay? <laughs> so take a moment. I know it's only it's two pages. But take a moment just to look at this covenant. And as you do that, I want to share a few reflections on it. 
first, this covenant emphasizes that we are servants of Christ. There's a line that says, it is necessary, therefore, that we consider what it means to be a servant of Christ. Much of this covenant is de declaring what it means to be a servant of Christ. And I think that's both helpful and challenging. Because I don't know if we walk around identifying and declaring and discussing what it means that we are servants of Christ. I don't hear that language in our church a lot. I am a servant of Christ. We are servants of Christ. We know it's there in Scripture. We understand it. But I think this language is not language that we use a lot in our church today. I'm reminded of Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church, one of the most fruitful Methodist churches in our country. Pastor Mike Slaughter came out to Hawaii a few years ago, and I remember in talking to him, he said to me, you know, we do not call folks in our church volunteers. We do not have staff and volunteers. We have paid servants and unpaid servants. We don't have staff and volunteers. We have paid servants and unpaid servants, and we don't have volunteers because volunteers serve when it's convenient. If I'm a volunteer and, you know, that's... I can't make it, I'm a volunteer. A servant, that's a different mindset. This covenant emphasizes that we are servants of Christ. Second, this covenant highlights that servants of Christ need to be all in. Notice these words, Christ will not accept anything except full consent to all that he requires. Christ will be all in all or he will be nothing. See, as I think about it, in the long run, half measures don't work in marriage, do they? In the long run, half measures don't work in marriage, and half measures don't work in Christian discipleship. Wesley once gave a sermon called The Almost Christian, in which he argued that many folks who go to church are almost Christians, or half Christian, as he put it. And he exhorted people to be altogether Christian instead. And I got to tell you, even for myself, and I'm a pastor, as I read through this covenant, I found myself asking, am I living as an almost Christian or an altogether Christian? Third, this covenant calls us to repent of the ways that we are not all in. And in particular, to put away our idols. So important. John Calvin said that the human heart is an idol factory. We all struggle with idols but we're really good at not seeing our own idols. <laughs> like we're really good at having blind spots toward our own idols. But an idol is anything we put ahead of or before God, anything we value more than God, anything that would keep us from fully living as a servant of Christ. And the thing about idols is that they keep us from being fruitful. God wants us to bear fruit, to be fruitful as Christian disciples. And idols keep us from being fruitful. I think what makes idols so hard is that a lot of the time, not all the time, but often idols are good things. When I look at our culture, my life, our world, I think of the idol of success, a huge idol, or family, or kids, or money, or comfort. Any of these, any of these things can become an idol in our life. Lastly, I want to comment on one line in particular. There's a line you'll see where we pray together, O oh, blessed Jesus, I come to you hungry, sinful, miserable, blind, and naked, unworthy even to wash the feet of your servants. I do here with all my power accept you as my Lord and head. I renounce my own worthiness. Sound kind of strong? All right? I mean, that's kind of strong language, I think, which is why I want to highlight it, because the bulk of those lines actually come from Scripture. And they come from Revelation 3, verse 17. And in Revelation 3, Jesus is talking to a church. And Jesus says this to the church. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. <laughs> Here's a church that thinks, ah, we're rich. We're okay. You're okay. We've got everything we need. We're fine. And Jesus is saying, you don't understand spiritual reality. You don't understand that spiritually you're poor and blind and naked. And so in this line, we're basically saying, 
I don't trust in myself. I trust in Jesus, in his righteousness, in his grace, and his guidance. So we're going to enter into this covenant together. I'm going to share a few words of introduction, and then we'll get to the invitation part, which is on your handout and will be on the screen. And you'll notice that if there is part of the prayer where we are invited to kneel or to bow, and I invite you to do so as you feel led. So first the introduction and then the words that we will share together. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Christian life is redeemed from sin and consecrated to God. Through baptism, we have entered this life and have been admitted into the new covenant of which Jesus Christ is the mediator. He sealed it with his own blood that it may last forever. On the one side, God promises to give us new life in Christ, the source and perfecter of our faith. And on the other side, we are pledged to live no more for ourselves, but only for Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. From time to time, we renew our covenant with God, especially when we reaffirm our baptismal covenant and gather at the Lord's table. Today we meet, as the generations before us have met, to renew the covenant that binds us with God. Let us make this covenant of God our own. So now the invitation. Commit yourselves to Christ as his servants, Give yourselves to him that you may belong to him. Christ has many services to be done. Some are more easy and honorable. Others are more difficult and disgraceful. Some are suitable to our inclinations and interests. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. But there are other works where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. It is necessary, therefore, that we consider what it means to be a servant of Christ. Let us, therefore, go to Christ and pray. Let me be your servant under your command. I will no longer be my own. I will give up myself to your will in all things. Be satisfied that Christ shall give you your place and work. Lord, make me what you will. I put myself fully into your hands. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and with a willing heart give it all to your pleasure and disposal. Christ will have no servants except by consent. Christ will not accept anything except full consent to all that he requires. Christ will be all in all or he will be nothing. Therefore, be prepared to renew your covenant with the Lord. Fall down on your knees, lift your hands toward heaven, open your hearts to the Lord as we pray. O righteous God, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, see me as I fall down before you. Forgive my unfaithfulness in not having done your will, for you have promised mercy to me if I turn to you with my whole heart. God requires that you shall put away all your idols. I hear from the bottom of my heart, renounce them all, covenanting with you that no known sin shall be allowed in my life against your will, I have turned my love toward the world. In your power, I will watch all temptations that will lead me away from you. For my own righteousness is riddled with sin, unable to stand before you. Through Christ, God has offered to be your God again, if you would let him. Before all heaven and earth, I here acknowledge you as my Lord and God. I take you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for my portion and vow to give up myself, body and soul, as your servant, to serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of my life. God has given the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way and means of coming to God. Jesus, 
I do here on bended knees accept Christ as the only new and living way and sincerely join myself in a covenant with him. O blessed Jesus, I come to you hungry, sinful, miserable, blind, and naked, unworthy even to wash the feet of your servants. I do here with all my power accept you as my Lord and head. I renounce my own worthiness and vow that you are the Lord, my righteousness. I renounce my own wisdom and take you for my only guide. I renounce my own will and take your will as my law. Christ has told you that you must suffer with him. I do here with covenant with you, O Christ, to take my lot with you as it may fall. Through your grace I promise that neither life nor death shall part me from you. God has given holy laws as the rule of your life. I do here willingly put my neck under your yoke to carry your burden. All your laws are holy, just, and good. I therefore take them as the rule for my words, thoughts, and actions, promising that I will strive to order my whole life according to your direction and not allow myself to neglect anything I know to be my duty. The Almighty God searches and knows your heart. O oh God, you know that I make this covenant with you today without guile or reservation. If any falsehood should be in it, guide me and help me to set it aright. And now glory be to you, O God the Father, whom I from this day forward shall look upon as my God and Father. Glory be to you, O God the Son, who have loved me and washed me from my sins in your own blood, and now is my Savior and Redeemer. Glory be to you, O God, the Holy Spirit, who by your almighty power have turned my heart from sin to God. O mighty God, the Lord Omnipotent, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have now become my covenant friend. And I, through your infinite grace, have become your covenant servant. So be it. And let the covenant I have made on earth be ratified in heaven. Amen. I want to invite us to just take a moment of reflection. Just to reflect on the words that we just shared and what this covenant means to you what this covenant calls you to do. Take a moment of silent reflection as we prepare to receive communion. For we make this covenant in and through Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection, in giving himself up for us on the cross, in dying and being raised again. He gives us the grace and the strength to enter into this covenant. It is not our own righteousness. It is not our own worthiness. We do not justify ourselves. But Jesus has justified us. And in his grace, he strengthens us to live as God's covenant people. So let's just take a moment of silent reflection as we turn to this communion table. In some ways, I think of once, uh, you, know, you know, in a wedding, uh, the rings are exchanged after the covenant, right? After the vows. We have just made vows to God. And instead of exchanging rings, we are going to come and celebrate now this bread and this cup. But they are our symbols of the covenant. So let's take a moment of silence as we turn to this table.